Good morning. If you are in the West Coast, like myself and uh, um, Nora Barakat, who will be the discussant for uh, this panel, and good afternoon if you are in the uh, you know East Coast. Well, it is not quite East Coast time for Zozan, but soon it will be. And good evening if you are joining us from across the ocean, like our uh, moderator today, uh, Professor Sam White. Uh, my name is Baki, Baki Tezjan. I teach history at the University of California in Davis, and I convene the um, three different series of uh, online meetings for the Ottoman and Turkish Studies Association. Uh, I'm going to start with telling you just a little bit about uh, today and what is coming up, and then I'm going to pass uh, the mic to uh, Professor White. So uh, today, as you all know, you're here, you signed up for this. We are here for Nomads and Climate, the Crisis of Pastoralism in Late Ottoman Kurdistan. Uh, this is going to be, uh, and, and uh, the speaker, Zozan, will be introduced by Sam in a minute. What I wanted to tell you, though, is what is coming up next week so that in case you are free next Friday to join us, you consider it. So next Friday, we will have our OTSA co-op meeting for this month. OTSA co-op meetings are not every month, they're occasional. Uh, this month, uh, we are going to be hosting a, a sort of a larger group, perhaps, to talk about Sabiha Sertel's struggle for modern Turkey. Uh, this is her autobiog autobiography, was translated recently uh, by David Selim Sayers. Um, and uh, uh, Abram uh, Sires as well. And then there were two co-editors who happened to be, who happened to be relatives of Sabia Sertel. They will be with us, Tia O'Brien and Nur Derish. And then we will also have James Meyer and James Ryan who taught this book in their classes. They'll share their experiences about how it went with American undergraduates. Benjamin Fortner will be the moderator and we will have uh, Ezgi Basharan, a contemporary uh, journalist from Turkey, who will reflect on her own experiences as a woman journalist in Turkey today through uh, Sabia Sertel's experiences, sort of comparing, contrasting them. Uh, it will be, I'm sure, interesting to see uh, and maybe to gauge, you know, where we were, where are we today? Is it any different? Maybe, maybe it is not that different in terms of suppression of free press. Uh, we'll see. Uh, so I hope you'll join us. And then uh, for what's up in June, we will have the winner of our uh, Vangelis Kekviotis prize uh, with us, Dimitri uh, Stergiopoulos. He will be sharing with us his dissertation um, proposal, uh, the economic activities and the political ambitions of bankers and merchants in Greece and the Ottoman Empire during the crisis of the 1870s. Uh, the uh, moderator for that panel will be Christine Filiu and the discussant Evgenia Davidova. Uh, I hope uh, you can join us for one of these, and then we'll have more programming coming up. I want to take one more minute to tell you about the OTSA Undergraduate Scholarship. If you are teaching classes with students interested in visiting Turkey, please encourage them to apply to this scholarship. We have $1,500 to give to an undergraduate student to go to Turkey in the summer um, to learn language and or do other things. Uh, the information required, the details, etc., are on the OTSA website. I hope uh, you'll encourage your students. And now we are coming back to our panel today, and let me introduce Professor Sam White. Uh, Sam White teaches at the Ohio State University. He is an environmental historian. Uh, his first book uh, was focused on the Ottoman Empire, the climate of rebellion in the early modern Ottoman Empire, uh, which uh, was very well acknowledged throughout uh, the fields of uh, both in Ottoman and, and Turkish studies, in Middle Eastern studies, uh, with three different book prizes. Uh, so he is no stranger to the Otsa uh, audience. And his second book, The Little Ice Age and Europe's Encounter with North America, uh, received prizes from the Ohio Academy, Academy of History and the 16th Century Society, and it was also a finalist for the Kundal Prize. Um, he is right now joining us from Bern, Switzerland, where he's spending his sabbatical, 
doing research on a new project. And I'm very grateful that he took some time to join us today as uh, he is uh, a, well, a, a sort of a, in the vanguard of environmental history, carrying it into our fields, uh, sort of introducing environmental history to our field. And his steps were followed by many others, I think, around his time, uh, there were other environmental history studies done. And of course, today we have Ellen Mikhail at Yale, who uh, does environmental history of the Ottoman Empire in the Middle East. And today we'll have Zozan Pehlivan talking about environmental history with a prize that he got for her article. Right, Sam, please take it from here. All right, thank you very much for that introduction. And I'd like to say it's great to see so many uh, familiar names among the guests with us today. Uh, so I'll introduce our presenter and then our discussant, and then I will pass it over to Zozan. So Zozan Pelivan is Assistant Professor of Environmental History and the McKnight Land Grant Professor at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. Her research focuses on the history of environments, violence, comparative empires, and pastoral nomads. Currently, she's working on her first book monograph, uh, Before the Genocide, Pastoralists, Peasants, and Environmental Crises in Late Autumn in Kurdistan. And that's under review currently with Cambridge University Press uh, for their studies in environment and history series. Now in that book, she examines socioeconomic and environmental implications of late 19th century climatic anomalies, uh, their impact on peasants and pastoralists and the way it shaped intercommunal relations between Christian Armenian peasants and Muslim Kurdish pastoralists. Uh, our, uh, excuse me, our, our discussant to follow is uh, Nora Barakat, Assistant Professor of History at Stanford University, and her scholarship and teaching focus on political economy and legal history of the late Ottoman Empire and the Middle East. Her first book, Bedouin Bureaucrats, Mobility and Property in the Ottoman Empire, explores the role of tent dwelling communities in Syria uh, and their role in modern state formation. She's also working on a project on rural production patterns, the history of capitalism, and codified Ottoman law and its legacies in the Eastern Mediterranean and Persian Gulf. So with uh, no more ado, I'll pass it over to Zozan to talk about her now prize-winning article, El Nino and the Nomads, Global Climate, Local Environment, and the Crisis of Pastoralism in Late Ottoman Kurdistan. Uh, Zozan, I'll leave it to you. Uh, hi, everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, good uh, morning, I would say, from Minneapolis. Um, it's a sunny morning we have, finally. Um, so thank you, Baki, for organizing this, and thank you also, actually, uh, as well as the committee members uh, for uh, their work and time to put into the evaluation of the article. Uh, I'm very honored to receive um, a Barkan Award uh, after my uh, mentor, Ariel Salzman. Um, 28 years after her uh, um, Barkan Award. Uh, and thank you, Nora and Sam, for being here and um, uh, the ch being chair and as well as the discussant. Uh, so uh, what I'm going to do, let me share my screen. And uh, I will um, kind of take you um, to kind of general um, framework of my article. And then how, how do I situate this article as part of my larger book project? Um, okay. Uh, are you able to see it? Okay, great. So um, what I do in this uh, work is uh, my work in general focus on Ottoman Kurdistan in, in 19th century and the ways in which uh, how communal relations uh, have been affected largely by kind of occurrence of environmental crisis. So this is a, it's a project that I have been working on since 2011, um, and uh, it's more than 10 years uh, kind of uh, dedication for, for this project. And the article um, is part of this larger project that I kind of established the ground uh, to situate um, the occurrence of violence in this region and the ways in which that violence came out um, that um, kind of uh, ended up with the expulsion of Armenians and the occurrence of Armenian genocide uh, organized by the Ottoman Empire in uh, uh, early 20th century. Uh, so my major question is like, um, 
I, I had two major questions in, in this entire kind of larger book project is how does, how can we situate, how can we understand environmental crisis and, and how do they impact on kind of intercommunal relations? How, how, how these people have been kind of interacted with each other? How does this, this crisis affected their everyday life and the material conditions of everyday life in these uh, extremely diverse uh, environments? So, um, this, these were kind of general uh, questions. And my, my main purpose was just like offering an alternative uh, understanding, offering an alternative narrative to this history of violence that has been always ex explained through the ethnicity, through the religious identities, through the nationalism, or the, through the uh, kind of agency of the state. State is the agent or the, um, these people were Muslims and Christians and they hate each other. They, they never were good with each other. And these, these type of questions kind of, my entire purpose was just like, how can, how can we take this uh, a narrative outside of ethno-religious boundaries and understand the history of this region outside of these boundaries? So um, by what I mean by this region, uh, so this is um, an, an area is about uh, larger than Italy uh, in terms of geographic um, uh, scale is 335 uh, square kilometers and um, the about uh, um, it's, it's, it's complete kind of comprising today's Eastern Turkey, Southeastern Turkey, Northern Iraq, Northern Syria, and some parts of Western Iran. Um, uh, and in 19th century, uh, the region was about inhabited by kind of two and a half, three million uh, people. 60% um, uh, of them were uh, peasants, uh, about 30% were pastoralists, and 10% were urban residents. Uh, and ethno-religiously, it was uh, pretty diverse. Uh, Armenians, Kurds, Armenian, Kurdish, Arabic, uh, Nastorian, um, Syriacs, uh, um, uh, Greeks, some Jews. Uh, it was extremely diverse uh, culturally, religiously, uh, ethno-linguistically. Uh, so, and the article uh, that I uh, kind of, uh, this article examines, like raised two major questions. Uh, and, um, what type of climatic anomalies occurred in this uh, late 19th century Ottoman Kurdistan? And uh, what type of uh, implications, what were the severe, kind of, what were the immediate and severe implications of this crisis on, on like kind of pastoral nomadic population and the millions of herd animals? For doing this, um, I kind of used a very interdisciplinary historical methodology to kind of understand first the geographical uh, conditions, environmental and ecological conditions of this region, its climate, and, um, and how these crises can be understood within this geographical uh, um, kind of uh, environment. So, so um, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but uh, some, some of the uh, participants have pointed out you're, you're still on the slideshow view and you might want to use the presentation view so that the, oh, it will be so sorry. free. Oh, sorry, I, okay, let me, so I will stop share first and then go back to, uh, okay, so. Uh, is it better now or is it the same? Uh, yes, this, this is better. We now have it. Okay, full screen. Perfect. So this is, uh, this is the region of, uh, and this is, uh, by using, I first use kind of GIS to understand kind of to make the, uh, the, the kind of layers of the, uh, layers of the geographical scoop. Uh, so, and this is, uh, if you kind of see a kind of a physical geography map of the Ottoman um, Anatolia or Eastern Anatolia, you would see almost it's brown. But when you zoom in, actually, this, the, the layers got mu much more complicated. And this is an area, when we look at it, um, about 44% of it is, um, is lowland, uh, about 20% is highland, is about 28% is uh, what's called um, a mountainous highland 
and less than 10% is rough mountains, meaning uh, it's uninhabitable by, not, by animals or uh, by human beings. So, uh, and the gray areas are the kind of the rough mountains that demonstrate uh, this uh, scoop. So, and this geography actually that I call landscape uh, trilogy of Kurdistan, the mountains, plains, and pastures kind of determine what kind of socioeconomic uh, form of subsistence exists in this uh, region and pastoralism uh, what I call is, uh, it is the pastoralism that kind of uh, intertwine these three ecological landscape with each other, their mobility, it was their mobility and their animals mobility that intertwine these regions that kind of con establish a connection between these uh, three uh, landscapes as well as um, determined. So what I call pastoral, it was the pastoralism that, that made Ottoman Kurdistan. So um, for doing this, I used uh, kind of uh, various historical documents, uh, including Ottoman and British uh, archival materials. And then I will, I, will, I will give more attention to other sources. Uh, so these, these are kind of the sources, the, the maps, uh, the, gr the green areas that demonstrate the, the uh, what's called forest areas of the uh, Ottoman Kurdistan. Uh, from Van uh, Diyarbakir, uh, Bitlis, and Mamratul Aziz. Um, another set of questions that I used is uh, British and Ottoman archival uh, documents. And every archival document, as we know, every archive has its own particular uh, notion. The Ottoman documents would kind of have different understanding of region as they know the region. The British have different mentality, different notions, and different kind of purposes uh, for, for 19th century. And so the amount of environmental knowledge uh, that I I got from the British uh, sources was much actually um, effect was much kind of um, informative to for me to imagine the region as the British kind of try to understand the ecology, the environment of the region, uh, kind of uh, the climate of the region. So it contains much more information. And the second purpose is that the region was kind of, um, uh, was called as a, as a gateway, as a bridge uh, to Indian Ocean uh, world, especially uh, to India. So they had to know the region very well. And from 1830s onward, they kind of produced enormous amount of archival documents about the environment and ecology of this uh, region of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, so after I set up kind of these um, series of climatic anomalies in 19th century, I kind of raise another important question, whether these anomalies are kind of regional weather patterns or are they part of larger global climatic oscillations? Um, whether there is an, an, a kind of connection between regional weather events or regional climatic events and the global events. And that took me kind of, uh, or kind of forced me to go and uh, look uh, scientific studies. So uh, I did, dedicated enormous amount of time to kind of establish, to understand the nature of these series of climatic anomalies and how they kind of related with these uh, global oscillations. And for this purpose, I kind of extensively depend on, I relied on these um, uh, uh, climatology studies of climatologists, data chronological studies, and try to understand whether they are, what, whether they, they, there are um, kind of connections that are parallels between the re local and global uh, events. And those studies kind of uh, opened my eyes, let's say, to see that actually these crises were not kind of uh, separate independent crises, but, but also part of the larger global uh, climatic oscillation that has been articulated by many historians, particularly Mike Davis, who examined these crises as a for, as to, to situate, to understand the expansion of British colonialism uh, in South Asia and other parts of Indian Ocean uh, world. So uh, the next set of sources that I used is um, is um, kind of veterinary science of early Republican uh, era. Uh, and uh, for, uh, for um, students who work on this, uh, uh, who want to work on environmental history, I would say that uh, uh, early Republican literature is fascinating. It's so rich in order to understand uh, the, uh, the environment and ecology of Turkey, contemporary Turkey. So I, I kind of dedicated a, a lot of time to understand uh, the physiology 
biological um, uh, body of uh, sheep and goats and camels and mules and horses to, to understand like what kind of um, experience, like how does, do, how does drought or how does severe cold would impact uh, or would affect their uh, productivity capacity, their reproduction capacity, um, their weight, um, how, much, how much kind of, uh, let's say grass do, like does a sheep need to eat uh, in order to survive? Um, and like for how long they can survive without water, for how long they can survive uh, without, um, uh, like uh, under the kind of um, uh, se uh, severe cold. So like, and these kind of brought me to this uh, early Republican veterinary literature. The next kind of literature that I use is also about the soils as the kind of the implications of this crisis would be not only uh, affecting animals, but also the soil and the, the, the plains, the agricultural uh, uh, land. So, um, and the last uh, set of sources that I used is um, kind of um, helped me to imagine um, the uh, kind of uh, imagine the concrete uh, picture on the ground in 19th century, in late 19th century Ottoman Kurdistan. So the literature uh, in 19, um, 50s, uh, 1960s and 70s on, uh, on African pastoralists on East Africa uh, particularly was very helpful for me to imagine, kind of to imagine how this, how, what would have happened when pastoralists lose their animals. Uh, how does it how does it take for them to kind of recover their loss um uh if they can't recover their loss what kind of strategies what kind of um kind of form of resilience did they develop in order to recover their loss um and this these kind of questions brought me to this literature which was extremely helpful and uh, kind of allowed me to imagine the kind of potential picture of late 19th century ottoman uh kurdistan and of of course, um, the uh, last set of uh, sources that I use is um, fascinating pictures from uh, Abdul Hamid's uh, albums uh, of, um, and also kind of the, 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 the kind of the usage of the science and technology to raise animals, to kind of develop agriculture, to imagine, to develop the Ottoman economy in, in 19th century. So these are the kind of uh, the general uh, archival documents that I used. And as I said, um, my major questions were, how does, what, what kind of crisis happened? How do they affect um, pastoralists? What were the severe and direct implications of those crises uh, on, on pastoralists? Because there are short-term and long-term uh, implications of this crisis. And the article um, actually focusing on immediate and severe implications of these crises on pastoralists and their animals because the long-term crises are much more complex and uh, that is the kind of the subject of the uh, uh, of the uh, before the genocide uh, my book monograph so um and while i was doing this uh, i also kind of um wanted to kind of underline the integral role of the environmental stress on uh, intercommunal relations, uh, as well as kind of connecting political history with environmental history and kind of offering an alternative narrative to these, um, the history of violence in this region that has been always kind of, uh, have been seen, as I said uh, in the beginning, as, uh, as a form of kind of um, uh, dichotomy uh, between a desert and the soul. Um, and offering another form of kind of history of violence in these, uh, this region. So based on my archival studies and archival research, what I found in, uh, in, in my research is that there are these like kind of um, four major uh, periods of uh, climatic anomalies uh, in, this, uh, in 19th century in this region. Um, the first wave occurred in 1840s and actually in 1845, is, was kind of according to sci um, uh, scientific studies uh, or uh, the research of climatologists uh, is that is one of the kind of the most severe drought in the history of Anatolia in 400 years um, in, uh, at the time. So, uh, and then in late 19th century, what we see is that um, in last two decades, almost like back-to-back -back, uh, crises became very frequent and very intense. And um, the moment that they, 
became back a kind of uh, frequent and intense, the implications for pastoralists and uh, uh, animals uh, would be uh, severe as well. So while doing, um, after I kind of figured out these series of crises, I kind of, and establishing the, um, the connections between local and global uh, events, my next kind of uh, um, question was that, how, how does that affect the pastoralists uh, and their animals? And, um, and then I kind of mapped out the region's pastoralist population through the GIS. Uh, and um, and later I found af after publishing the article actually I found this uh, Hutterot's uh, 1950s uh, study on pastoralists and all uh, and uh, in in Turkey uh, in contemporary Turkey and he he did uh, a, a fascinating research uh, in 1950s despite of restrictions of uh, his research these restrictions that have been put by the Turkish state to for his research so he couldn't go further down, but kind of he mapped out these um, pasture lands of, uh, uh, of Kurdish, remaining Kurdish pastoralists in 19, uh, in 20th century. And kind of when I found this map, I kind of compare with my own research and it was kind of confirmation actually, it was a good, really good feeling to see it. So, and um, what uh, these um, kind of, uh, and that's kind of, Seeing these uh, pasture lands also meant that uh, different forms of mobility existed in this uh, region. And uh, again, um, uh, the article doesn't contain uh, the forms of mobility, but uh, seeing Hutterot's map actually was kind of confirming the mobility patterns of, uh, of what's called um, of pastoralists, some of them would move like uh, for 50 kilometers. Some of them had to move uh, like between their yaylak and kushlak winter and summer pastures had to move about like 400 kilometers. So there are different forms of uh, um, uh, mobility. So these kind of are my general uh, questions for the um, uh, for the for the article and kind of I later. Kind of focus on um, after setting up the synchronicity between local and global events. Kind of, I examine the implications of these crises, severe, implica uh, severe and kind of in um, uh, immediate implications of these crises on uh, on animals. So um, um, to wrap it up, the article actually established the ground for me to go further beyond this uh, narrative of climatic uh, crises or an environmental crisis. And what I'm trying to do uh, for my book project and situating this article in the, on the ground is that asking two fundamental questions. What were the long-term implications of the loss of millions of animals in the region, in a region that highly depend on livestock economy? And the next question is that, what was the role of Ottoman state? How can we situate the Ottoman state in this entire picture to understand the history of violence, intercommunal violence in the, in the region in like late 19th century? And the third question is, we cannot understand the history of this, uh, region or history of violence in this region by just focusing on the kind of the general ten, kind of um, uh, certain periods of time, let, let's say uh, 1890s pogroms or 1915. So to understand these the 1890s pogrom, we have to really look at before 1890s to, to understand what kind of economic and political and environmental circumstances were in the region and how those circumstances change after the uh, kind of um, after this uh, crisis. And I would uh, finally say it actually uh, later, I was reading Selim Deringil's um, uh, one of short piece on Armenian genocide. And he raised a fascinating question and say like, what kind of socioeconomic relationship exists between Kurds and Armenians, let's say in 1880s? And when I kind of read that passage, it was just like, yes, the 1880s story is this. Uh, this is the 1880s stories. And if we want to understand what brought Kurds and Armenians to slaughter each other or kind of uh, 
create this violence in this region that eventually evolved into genocide, though genocide was a completely different uh, form of violence organized by the Ottoman state, is like without understanding the ground, the conditions on the ground, we won't be able to understand the complete history of this violence in, in late 19th century Ottoman, uh, Ottoman Empire. So I will stop here and I'm looking forward for Laura's uh, questions. All right, uh, thank you very much for that presentation. And uh, I will go ahead and pass it to Nora for the comments. Thank you, Sam. Can everybody hear me okay? And thank you, Zozan, for writing this article. And thanks to Baki for asking me to serve as discussant and for organizing this event and advertising it and doing so much work for ASA in general. Um, so I'll just start by saying that Zozan's article takes those of us, including myself, who have not spent much time thinking about climactic patterns in our treatment of the rural history of the Eastern Mediterranean very much to task. This is a meticulous attention to the North Atlantic Oscillation and El Nino Southern Oscillation patterns and the historical data that climate scientists have produced. It gives us a new way of reading 19th century history. It opens the door to new periodizations and turning points. I also think it's important to note that attention to this data provides a new way to think about longstanding questions about how we characterize the Eastern Mediterranean, how we think about the Middle East as a historical space and how we think about its boundaries. And also for those of us experiencing the 21st century from epicenters of climate change like California, the rationale behind an inquiry of, the, of this inquiry is fairly obvious. I think Zozan's article also brings up new questions about the historical links between climactic shifts and human mobility. And this is an interconnection that's also quite relevant to our contemporary experience of crisis. Um, so Zozan focuses in particular on how weather patterns and 19th century climate change affected people categorized as and described in historical sources as Kurdish pastoralists i.e. people who relied for their livelihoods on herding as a form of production. In doing so, she introduces us not only to climactic patterns, but to the way these patterns affected particular species of livestock. And this leads me, I think, to one of the most important aspects of this article for those of us who are interested in rural political economy and maybe haven't spent as much time looking at um, these oscillation patterns. This is the way Zozan reveals how the herders of different livestock populations would have experienced weather patterns differently. And she does this with a very wide uh, array of sources, a lot of, of um, very close attention to data, to historical data, and a wide scope of empirical examples. So in the time I have, I'm going to outline four or five questions. So Zan, you can take them or leave them at will. The first two are historical and the others are more historiographical. So um, the end of your article and the presentation that you just gave le leads me very quickly to my first question. And I don't know how much you want to say about this because the book is not yet out. But at the end, you sort of tantalizingly point to the ways in which your research might change the way we think about the social history of Eastern Anatolia, especially the violence that this landscape witnessed from the late 19th century through the end of the Ottoman period. And I wonder if you might connect those dots for us a bit more here, right? How does attention to climate change help us understand changing intercommunal relationships and social tensions in the late 19th century? I think you gave us even more of a preview in your presentation than you did in the article, but um, maybe you wanna draw that out more or maybe you wanna skip to the next question. Um, but also what does this tell us about the roles of Kurdish pastoralists and perhaps other pastoralists in those conflicts? Um, the second question is, you start this article with a gesture to Davis's late Victorian Holocaust. And the article is certainly global in scope in the sense that these were obviously weather patterns that affected large geographical regions. And you spend a lot of interesting time thinking about which oscillation patterns are most relevant. Um, and you also mentioned now in your presentation how helpful the literature on East Africa was for imagining this ecology. And that was very striking to me. I'm curious, though, if you see any distinct parallels between the experiences of the pastoralists you study in Kurdistan and people who are described as pastoralists or herders elsewhere, and where this kind of tracing of weather patterns might take you in a string of research questions that could be quite global, right, but global in very sort of specific pattern-based ways. 
Um, a related but inverse question is, was this a crisis that had particular parameters in Kurdistan, right? Could such a comparative project show us anything that's unique about um, the experience of these, of these crises in Kurdistan? A related question, which is gonna move us more into the world of the historiographical, is just about how you see crisis as a historical phenomenon that's very much wrapped up as in Davis's narrative with the expansion of the modern state, right? This is something I've grappled a lot with in my own work, especially teaching on something called crisis in our current historical moment. How should we read crisis as a phenomenon historically or as a claim in the imperial archives when it has been such a useful tool for imperial governments themselves? Um, I'm gonna wrap up uh, with a kind of uh, the, a, a longer historiographical question. I hope you'll bear with me and I hope it's useful, but if it's not, again, just go back to the other ones. So I was really intrigued and stuck for a long time on your reference to and critique of Owen Lattimore's work on Mongolia early on in the article. Um, and Lattimore's work takes us back to the mid 20th century, but it's also recently been used extensively by scholars like James Scott in his book Against the Grain that came out about five years ago. And Scott draws very heavily on Lattimore's problematization of the linkages in 19th and 20th, so 20th century social theory between cultivation on the one hand and human civilization on the other. So he leans on Lattimore to suggest, and I think you're also critiquing this, that nomadism might be more adaptable both to climactic shift and also I think for Scott might be, might be a way of adapting to the modern state or becoming emancipated from the modern state, right? And I wonder, if, I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit on your critique of Lattimore. I'm particularly interested in your thoughts after this very exhausted exercise of showing how devastating temperature shifts could be to livestock. Is it productive to think about human adaptability to climactic shifts within these 19th and 20th century social categories that are based on particular understandings of mode of production, right? So to put that differently, are there any human groups or communities with a unique advantage in the face of climatic shift? Um, at one point you write that geography, climate and landscape shape the destiny of these pastoralists and their herds. And I'm wondering if you think that's more true from a historical perspective for some human communities than others. Um, the last, the reason I wanted to ask about Lorimer, Latimer, Latimer um, and Scott is also because I think they gesture in another direction, but they don't really explicate it. But it's been useful for me to think with them um, in this direction. And that's the way that social categories that shape the production of statistics, which you're very closely engaged with, um, these are late 19th and, and early 20th century statistics, the way they fix communities into particular modes of production as settled or as nomadic pastoralists. But they also really centered an agrarian imaginary, and I, I, I mean, I wonder if you agree with me about this, that is village-based, that really privileges village-based settled production of agricultural commodities. And this was an agrarian imaginary that privileged settled, settled cultivation that the British and Ottomans definitely shared. And we've seen that in, in, in a bunch of different work. Um, but it was also really important to emergent legal constructions of private property, right, that also privileged um, cultivation in determining rights to land. And this comes out for me very clearly in your article when you mention the imperial impression that certain groups were not used to agriculture, also the idea that groups classified as nomadic were encroaching on the lands of those classified as settled. This is um, language that I see a lot in my own work as well. So my question is, how does this attention to the political and legal agendas of historical social categories affect the way that we think about and engage with historical data, especially these counting projects that you're engaging with of different communities that are disaggregated by, as you're saying, not only by ethnic group, but also by mode of production. Um, and I wonder, this is in a sense a question for Sam too, and a question for all of the environmental historians who are with us today, if there's a place for this kind of discursive critique of the categories of data production in environmental history more broadly. Um, and if so, what that, what that place is and how we, how we can engage um, with that problem of, of, uh, of the categories of data production that we're using. Um, I'm gonna stop there and I think I'm passing it to Sam. Thank you, all of you. Thank you, Zazan. Oh. 
before I, I, I jump in with my own questions, you've got a lot on, on your plate at the moment. So I will uh, I will pass it actually to you, Sazan, if you want to uh, answer any of those um, or uh, address them. Uh, if, if not, I, I will maybe toss out a couple of ideas, but uh, I'll give you the chance first. Okay. Um, so thank you so much, Nora. These are all wonderful questions. Um, so I think uh, the social history of violence, that for that, for being able to answer that question, I need to summarize three chapters of the book. <laughs> uh, so that that would that because um, every every layer has um, has I can't explain one layer without the other layer, and the it's it is complex. But what I can summarize easily is that when like these the 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 long term implications of this crisis not all affected since pastoralists are um, extremely depend on their animals when their animals lost when they lost their animals they lost their uh, source of food they lost their uh, source of wealth they lost their source of political and social power and they also lost um, kind of um, their uh, form of uh, form of life as well so they have no option but um, finding an alternatives, okay? And there are different forms of alternatives. One, you can settle down if you can find a piece of land or if you get, have been given by a piece of land to the, by the state and settle down. Uh, and in an area like Ottoman Kurdistan where arable lands are extremely low and where aridity is very high, it is not a kind of common option. The second option, you can change your migration routes and find uh, uh, other forms of kind of, uh, kind of suitable pasture lands to, to help your animals to survive. And in an area, again, when the aridity is, is a very uh, common and very kind of uh, effective form of um, environment is that it, it's not an option too. So the third option is that um, you will direct your anger or you will, dire you will direct your poverty to other forms of wealth. And that would be, uh, for example, in the region, as in my book chapter, I kind of examined about 400 cases or 350 uh, 100 cases of animal rustling, animal theft, became a very common form of uh, resilience among pastoralists. So who can you steal their animals? It's peasants or it's your neighboring pastoralists. And, and that became one of the most um, uh, kind of uh, um, important, one of the most significant ingredients of violence in this region. So animal theft is wanted. And when you bring the state in these uh, narrative, you see another form of politics. And um, and the what I kind of agree, what kind of what kind what what I kind of argue is that uh, the occurrence of the organization of paramilitary forces, Hamidian militias, was not coincident in 1890s when they have been when they all accepted the offer of Sultan. Like um, that was not a coincidence kind of time because they already lost everything and the offer that Hamidian state made to them is is was a it was a, was an acceptable offer because it was giving them legitimacy it was giving them food it was giving them income and more important it was giving them arms so they would of course accept this offer and that that would exacerbate the level of uh, violence and organization of the animal theft events so that would be i will leave there um, but the layers are, are, are there. Um, and um, in terms of the, uh, the crisis uh, and uh, uh, it, 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 crisis, yes, it is a useful tool, but it doesn't, it doesn't give us um, uh, the entire narrative. So we cannot understand the history of this region through crisis. So what I do kind of, um, I, I kind of, I intend to do in the book is that not only describing the this particular time frame, but also I explain the history of this region before crisis. So, like the first kind of two chapters of the book is actually are about uh, what kind of socioeconomic environment exists in this region. What do they produce? How much do they produce? What kind of um, um, global uh, trade networks did they involve? Um, and how much how much income was coming to the region? And 
what like and how did like how does the production of uh, livestock how, how does like livestock economy kind of brought um, peasants pastoralists and urban dwellers together what kind of economic system was existing in 19th century before this crisis so that was kind of the the so it it's the crisis is only one kind of like kind of crisis is only covering about the last two decades of the 19th century for the region. And so it would it 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 be, there is a path there is a picture of before crisis and uh, it's a useful tool but um, it is uh, it is uh, it is it's not explaining uh, um, exactly so and also um, the the involvement of the Ottoman state in these um, in this narrative or Mike Davis's work on British colonialism in South Asia and what I kind of this is taking me in my second project uh, that um, the comparative, I think what would uh, a comparative approach um, of uh, kind of indigenous people, this can be um, uh, Kurdish pastoralists in Kurdistan um, and uh, or um, um, uh, um, uh, the uh, herding groups in British Punjab or uh, um, uh, Native Americans in the Great Plains, everybody experienced this crisis somehow in late 19th century and so an experience like and what i kind of try to understand for for my kind of next project and i won't focus here is that like and it's kind of answer to your question is that the empires always use this crisis as a as a, as a tool to expand their state formation to ex to exploit these uh, the available limited natural resources and also uh kind of um complete this the state formation and uh, kind of establish their hegemony so the, the story of in in uh, Great Plains uh, in late 19th century, uh, as um, I was reading Chris Gratian's uh, recent book in Chukurova, the comparisons are really kind of, uh, are, 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 are the similarities, the trends are kind of, uh, uh, are, are, are clear. And you, we, we can see this, uh, these uh, kind of, uh, uh, these um, similarities. So, uh, and the, um, the Latimer's question. Um, so I think um, what is very distinctive between Central Asia and Kurdistan is that the geography and the environment. So the, the space, the space and like as um, John McNeil uh, worked as uh, demonstrate is that the relation, the kind of the distance between uh, pastures and the plains are very small, are very short in, in the Middle East, unlike, uh, unlike Central Asia. And um, and the the implications of this crisis uh, and what also distinctive in in the Middle East is that as as McNeil argues is that this is a very arid climate and when aridity is like any any little change and Sam's work too uh, demonstrates uh, that any changes in the climate would have really direct implications on on the on the conditions on every uh, on material conditions in, in on the ground so um and the 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 this too i think kind of brings that um the the to brings us to kind of what if we look at the kind of immediate uh, implications immediate uh, effects on on pastoralists and and the, the, the difference between agrarian and herding economies in terms of resistance to climate, and it's, it comes forward in the archival documents. So first of all, pastoralists, most of them do not have, do not have um, protections, like kind of barns to put their animals during the night. Okay, the, the animals are more, more vulnerable to outside environment and climatic conditions. The second thing is that, like, and peasants are able to hold their animals. The second thing is that what um, scientific studies uh, show that the, 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 like, for example, it takes such, if, if you lose the animals, let's say, 70% um, uh, um, uh, of the herd, let's say, perish, it takes about eight and 10 years to recover these animals. So for agrarian uh, household, however, if your farm is is uh, what's called um, uh, decimated by drought, um, and if you have some seed given by the state, or you found some seed and you found some uh, animal power, muscle power to plow this the soil, uh, you at the and you have kind of 
let's say, normal or reasonable amount of rainfall, it would take you one or two years to recover your loss. So the difference, the, the, what, that, what I call in my book is ecological disequilibrium between agrarian and herding societies in Kurdistan. So it was this ecological disequilibrium that actually have forced us to think about the dimension of violence and the layer of violence in this, uh, this region. Um, and um, and I think I will skip your uh, last question as it has many kind of sides and um, so. All right, um, I will uh, just take the opportunity to give uh, one quick question, which may just be a thought for your book, um, if we want to move on to the questions from the audience, and then, then I will uh, pass it over to Baki to uh, begin fielding questions, since I see hands are being raised already. Uh, and that thought or, or question, if you'd like to address it now, um, is what lessons do we draw, I think, not just from a, I'd say, a synchronic comparison, looking globally at the uh, disasters uh, of the late 19th century, uh, as discussed by Mike Davis and others, um, but also thinking of this diachronically and whether there are lessons that apply for sustainability in the face of climatic change, both reaching deeper into the past, perhaps, and also reaching up into present climate change. I think this would be a factor, especially in considering uh, a book that's presented to a wide audience of environmental historians, which are publishing in the environmental uh, history series. Uh, so for instance, in addition to what you might call the uh, immediate ecological vulnerabilities, the exposure to climate change, are there perhaps more systemic vulnerabilities that played a role? Um, so to the features of social or political or uh, economic organization uh, that created vulnerabilities uh, to crisis on a larger scale. So I'll leave it at that. Okay, so the, the, the sustainabilities and the, the, in the age of the climate change, I would say is um, what this study demonstrates or what I, I, I kind of show is that it's really important for us to kind of see the kind of how repeated or frequent crisis might lead all sorts of um, uh, kind of not only economic problems, but social tensions in an areas where you have kind of highly um, diverse areas and it could actually how this such crisis could actually um, activate uh, all sorts of uh, fault lines within the society and how they can be manipulated by, by different actors. It can be state as we see in the Ottoman Empire, or this can be um, uh, kind of uh, uh, other forms of uh, political powers. And I think what uh, this work offers is that the in areas where you have all these different forms of economic form of subsistence, the occurrence of crisis might lead and and is actually is happening in East Africa, in Kenya, in Nigeria, in Somalia. So there are there are different uh, form kind of confrontations between herders and uh, and peasants. So it 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 kind of force policymakers, I would say, or have to kind of force for, or offer. And a, a, a kind of uh, um, a picture to for policymakers that to to see like without actually labeling certain groups and identifying them with certain behaviors, we kind of to look at these uh, these uh, material conditions and try to offer um, what's called a, a remedy or a, a kind of a helpful tool uh, to 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 prevent. Uh, the the kind of the conditions to come that that uh, that uh, level. All right, I'll pass on to Baki then to take questions. I see a number of hands. All right, thank you, thank you so much to uh, Zozan and to Nora and Sam, and I'm gonna do the Q and A. But before that, I uh, remembered I actually. Uh, uh, omitted something that I should have mentioned both today and also actually in the last WhatsApp, uh, I should have paid uh, our thanks. I uh, mentioned uh, the members of the prize committee that uh, worked on the Ömer Lutfi Barkan article prize last year. Uh, Faisal Hussein was the chair and I believe he was among us here. Uh, and then Melissa Bilal and Milena Metodieva were the members of that committee. Um, and I am grateful to them 
for having read many, many, many articles that were submitted uh, to the competition last year. And uh, it is thanks to them that we have Zozan here uh, giving us this wonderful presentation on this great article. So thank you, Faisal. And Faisal was with us uh, at an earlier uh, WhatsApp uh, that featured two books, uh, one of which was his, Rivers of the Sultan, the Tigris and Euphrates in the Ottoman Empire. In that WhatsApp, we had also another environmental history book, the one about uh, Mecca that also won Mesa's Book Award. So there's a lot happening uh, in environmental history. And Ellen Mikhail was the chair of that panel. If you look at our YouTube channel, you can find that as well. Now, today, if you have questions and you would like to, oh, you just missed my video there. That is because I'm using an outside cable and a little touch makes me disappear, but you can hear me, so I don't need to be on the screen. Uh, please raise your hand if you would like to ask your question in person, and I already see two hands that I will acknowledge in a minute, and if you also, you can also send your questions on chat, and there are two questions on chat. I will read them out loud for video recording so that we would have them in the recording. So now we'll start with Jawat Dargan first. Jawat Bey, buyurun, um, please. Hello, hi, uh, Zozan. Thank you for the presentation. I'm uh, really, uh, you know, interested in uh, what you are doing, and uh, I hope to um, read more of uh, what you have to write in the future. Um, I have a, uh, two related questions. One is this um, relationship between uh, uh, violence and uh, environmental crisis and uh, nomadism. Um, so my understanding is that, um, you know, uh, you know, there are uh, sedentary Kurds and uh, nomad Kurds, and I, I might be wrong, but uh, my understanding is that most of the intercommunal violence in the late 19th century between Armenians and Kurds uh, and others um, will take place in the town centers among the sedentary uh, com communities. So I wonder if um, you make this distinction between uh, you know, nomads might be facing environmental uh, crisis, but how much of that violence is actually between the nomad Kurds and and Armenians, and and or or in in the town centers with the sedentary Kurds, which who has more uh, economic relations or uh, more property uh, to to share with the rest of the community. And um, uh, maybe another point that, um, you know, I would like to, uh, maybe you, you just uh, as a comment to think about. Now, I work on um, the history of Dersim in the same historical period. And uh, this intercommunal relations is, uh, you know, important in my research too. Um, and it seems like uh, compared to rest of the Kurds, uh, Alevi Kurds in and around Dersim, had relatively good relations with Armenians, and that have uh, survived, uh, you know, uh, into the Republican era. Uh, you know, they have actually supported one another. So I wonder, considering that the Kurds in uh, in and around there, in the Alevi or the Qizilbash Kurds at large, uh, also having similar lifestyles uh, with the rest of the Kurds, Kurds, but having a, uh, you know a different relationship with the state. Uh, or the Kurds at large, how do you uh, kind of balance out this uh, other identity uh, politics uh, factors in this intercommunal relations uh, besides the environmental one? Uh, how how uh, widespread or universal do you think that your, your argument applies uh, across uh, all the Kurdish segments? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for these uh, two wonderful questions. So I think I will skip the, f the second one, but I will answer the, the first one. So there is um, a clear, so when you said the most of violence, the most studied violence um, occurred in the, in the urban centers and that scholars mostly focus on 1890s massacres, uh, pogroms, organized pogroms uh, in, in Diyarbakir, uh, in Harput, in Van, in, uh, in all different small towns or larger cities uh, of the Ottoman uh, Kurdistan during the 1890s. That's why when I underlined the, what this work actually shows is that, or the other chapters of the book shows is the, the stories that have not been told in the ruler spaces. So 
if we if we zoom in the rural areas, kind of the town town between towns, between little kind of pasture lands and the village, the story gets much more complex and it opens um, kind of more uh, windows for us to see all different forms of violence and the, the kind of distinction between the forms of violence that occurred in urban center versus the or town centers and the for, forms of violence um, like animal theft that has not been articulated at all by any form of by any scholars is um, in in the ruler uh, spaces and that by looking by focusing on these kind of ruler spaces kind of the zooming in in these little little kind of cases it helps us to see the material materiality of the conditions on the ground and how that contributed to the slow violence that rob nixon explains but in in the context of industrial world but it is it is accumulating it is a form of accumulation of violence in the on, on the in the uh, ruler spaces so we can only understand that by just kind of looking kind of closer look to the uh, to the uh, ruler spaces and see those uh, um, uh, every source of events uh, that actually contributed that accumulated occurrence of violence in this region and then eventually uh, expanded. Uh, so in terms of the um, identity politics, um, uh, the um, the Ottoman state is very uh, kind of uh, uh, as a as a form of, uh, uh, of empire has has its own logics and Abdul Hamid state is very uh, logically in these uh, um, kind of uh, in this regard it is very uh, kind of uh, following its own ideological agenda. So and if we look at for example the number of pastor Kurdish pastoralists like the Darsim Kurds that you refer to they also apply to be members of the paramilitary forces, but their requests have been rejected. So uh, the, the state, the Abdul Hamid state, was actually following its own ideological choice uh, instead of Kızılbaş or Alawi um, uh, Kurdish uh, pastoralists of Dersim, they kind of accepted the offer, gave the offer to Shafi uh, or Sunni Kurds and um, kind of um, was called recruited them uh, and so there was there was a clear cut ideological choice and i don't really think that um the uh the in, in, there was the identity politics kind of uh, you kind of mentioned that um it was um the if i do understand correctly is that uh there was there was there was not a kind of as uh, the relationship between kurds in dersim uh, versus uh, and in and Armenians were, were peaceful. So, well, under the kind of usual circumstances, these people were trading with each other. Uh, they they kind of having a very intertwined relationship. But um, I, I I I really I don't I I I haven't I haven't worked on this specific case and how, whether there were kind of the religious identity of uh, of people in this area kind of influenced the ways in which they deal with climatic uh, crises or with uh, the ways in which they experience this crisis, particularly in, the, in case of Darsim, I will skip that, uh, that part of the question. Thank you. Thank you so much. And again, I apologize. Uh, my uh, camera stopped functioning uh, after two years of COVID. My laptop's camera died and then I got an external camera and that one, even if I touch a tiny bit, it, it makes it malfunction. There is another hand and, and now I'm going to acknowledge Claudio uh, Krakchun. I, I am so sorry. I probably uh, sort of butchered the pronunciation of your name. Would you mind pronouncing it for us all yourself so that we have it right? And then please ask your question, Claudio. Thank you. You got it about right. Uh, I'm Claudio Krakchun. I'm based in Bucharest. So hello from Bucharest. Um, I'm a political scientist, um, and uh, thank you for allowing me to intrude in uh, in your environmental historian um, kind of a um, uh, meeting. Um, well, um, how, how I how I got here, I'm interested in the state building process in the Balkans, um, and of course, it's um, uh, very much related with the Ottoman history. And I took an interest in the Vlach communities. Uh, which were 
uh, for a part of their history, um, uh, nomad or semi-nomads. Um, and from this perspective of state building, and of course, kind of building on also on, on Mike Davis, uh, uh, from your paper, I got bits and um, very interesting bits on the uh, policy of the Ottoman imperial authorities regarding the, 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 the pastoralists. For example, uh, they were worried about um, taxing uh, the sheep and, you know, um, they're worried about the, the capacity to provide uh, transportation services and to support the, the army and so on. Um, and I was wondering if you can um, kind of uh, develop on the kind of end game of imperial authorities, how they saw nomads in the, in the wider sense, how did they kind of saw them in, um, uh, in, 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 in their project of state building, imperial in this case, um, because from the paper, and it's it's a very nice and interesting paper, coming from my own uh, perspective, I kind of felt curious uh, that there is something to be said there. Thank you very much. Oh, uh, thank you. Thank you for uh, this great question. And um, so the ways uh, Ottoman or the state, uh, imperial state solo nomads or pastoralists, uh, that's always um, a, a, a group that needs to be tamed. Um, though the policies change from time to time, sometimes they would make alliance with them if it's necessary. Sometimes they need to be tamed, forcefully sedentarized. And this became very common in 19th century. Sometimes they will make alliances with them and support them as Faisal Hussein's book uh, has shown for the early modern Iraq. So uh, in 19th century in this region as a frontier uh, region, uh, what um, for historically Ottoman empire always kind of kept the Kurdish pastoralists uh, alliance with them since it is the region that would on, on the front Frontier with Russia uh, and as well as uh, with Iran, and so have to have to keep um, good relations with them. So what happened in the 19th century is that the, the kind of starting from late 18th century uh, onward, the centralization attempt of the Ottoman states. Uh, Kind of uh, expanded, and in the, with the declaration of the Tanzimat, and in the, by the mid 19th century, the Tanzimat state was actually in the region, was almost everywhere in the region, and that um, we can see the growing Tanzimat state in the region when this pan crisis happened. So the ways in which, for example, the state involved into this crisis by providing food, by providing seed, postponing taxes, or collect collecting grains to the granaries, and all sorts of state references to the state infrastructure was very kind of, you can see the Tanzimat states, the consequences of the Tanzimat state in the, uh, in the region. That's one part of the state formation. The second part of the state formation is the, the kind of, um, during this time that the Ottoman government really tried to forcefully sedentarize some of them. So they will identify uh, these groups as so-called Hasharat, the, the infestations, um, the uh, in, a, a kind of, of uh, locus or infestations that needs to be destroyed completely. And different forms of politics have been applied. Some in some areas, um, they kind of uh, sedentarize uh, certain groups. But when this crisis happened, as I uh, kind of uh, have shown, when this crisis happened, these, these pastoralists who were forcefully sedentarized in certain areas, they kind of went back to the uh, to, to their uh, kind of um, their own uh, uh, historical form of uh, economic form of subsistence. So um, the 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 distinctive thing in late 19th century is that um, uh, the uh, what's called uh, as um, the Janet Klein has shown that um, is uh, the in, uh, kind of uh, organization of these paramilitary forces. And uh, and recruiting the pastoralists and as 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 a group to kind of be a useful uh, tool in this frontier region, and so they can't make kind of bar or can agree with uh, with uh, so they they don't kind of 
go with Iranians or with Russians or with the British because British were kind of more powerful. So the Ottomans kind of followed a, a very strategic uh, um, uh, mind. And, uh, and you can see in the British documents that uh, both of them, both British and Ottomans are kind of really worrying about which side pastoralists are going to be. So British would say, if, the, if they make agreement with the Russians, Russians would be in the Mediterranean Sea in three days. Um, and so the Ottomans kind of, um, the Abdulhamid state have seen that and to keep their, um, their loyalty. So he kind of, they imitated what Russians did with Kazakhs. And so they, by this way, they got their loyalty, but also they kind of used these uh, groups against the other so-called potential danger that they have identified as Armenians. So it was, it was kind of win-win situation for, the, for, the, for both sides. And when they did this, actually, they reinforced the entire hierarchical structure of pastoralism when they formulated these, um, these uh, uh, militia groups. These militias were not kind of, um, the, the state did not go and kind of, um, called for all members. So they invited the leaders of these uh, uh, groups and selectively. And uh, the uh, images that I have shown here, for example, um, uh, just a quick, uh, here, this, this, this one is, for example, is um, the, the Ottoman army is on the region and calling for pastoral leaders and their members to go and for do registration and, and next to the Tigris River in Jazeera. So, and these, these politics are not kind of randomly chosen. So, and they contribute, like the militia, the kind of organization of militias is, is a, another form of state formation in the region to get their loyalty and also kind of imposing Sultan's authority on, 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 on them. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now we have another hand up, and that is James Gustafsson. Uh, James, are you there? I am here. Thank you. Um, first of all, let me just thank Professor Pethavon for an outstanding presentation on what I think was a very um, important and thought-provoking article. Um, so I work on the Qajars a bit, and one of my interests in the Kurds, obviously, is the fact that they occupy this um, this frontier zone, in fact, one of the most important persistent frontier zones in, in, in the Middle East. And I was especially interested in what you said about this um, period of crisis in the 1880s providing an opportunity for the Ottomans to extend control over Kurdish communities. I was wondering if you had a sense of what's happening on the other side of the Zagros with Qajars. Um, I, I know a little bit about what's happening in say the Eastern borderlands of the Qajar empire at that time, because there were also similar problems. Um, but given that the Qajars were not very good at actually extending their control over their territories, there were a lot of say local military families that took control and ended up patrolling the frontiers on their own and actually supplanted a lot of the existing like landed elite and uh, commercial elite from that area. Um, I was wondering if you had a sense of like the different strategies taking place on opposite ends of the Zagros. If um, Kurdish communities in a way were sort of strategically shopping around when they enter into these arrangements with the Ottomans, but thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, uh, that's uh, thank you, James, uh, for this uh, great question. So first of all, you know Sabri's work um, and the, the Ottoman Iranian borders and borderlanders uh, in 19th century. So the Ottoman Iranian border from 1830s onwards, so the Ottomans were very kind of, as um, uh, uh, Hushit Pasha has uh, kind of articulated very well uh, in Sayat Name Hudud, uh, is that uh, they kind of as, try to establish the border with, uh, with Iran. But of course, um, uh, for, for, a, for an area where you have a large number of pastoral nomads, and these nomads are, they, some of the pastures in the other side of the border, some of their pastures in the other side of the border. So they had to constantly uh, move between the borders. And in 1880s and 1890s, there was this kind of um, situation between these two uh, areas that sometimes the pastor Kurdish pastoralists would still um, 
uh, Iranian pastoralist uh, animals or peasants animals and take to the other side of the border and Iranian soldiers would follow them some of, sometimes. Sometimes uh, the opposite would happen and that created kind of uh, different forms of conf kind of negotiation. So the Ottomans kind of try to um, em employ um, cavalries, uh, like official cavalries to protect the border. That's one thing. The other thing is that, which was very, I think, um, intriguing is that uh, in there are a few cases that I have seen is that um, the uh, to prevent the animal theft uh, across the border, uh, the Ottomans kind of um, took the, uh, the 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 thief into Divana Harp, uh, which is very I think. Uh, uh, interesting uh to to like the the war the the the, the high court of war uh as and uh, and it's, it's only actually animal theft but the to kind of prevent to protect i think that was a form of kind of um policy that actually is, is like to prevent the the occurrence of this event but also protecting the uh the the border because they had they were they were following each other and the third Thing that was very uh, became very uh, effective is that when Rinderpest uh, hit the empire uh, in 1840s, uh, sorry, in 1880s, uh, as Mehmet Ak has shown uh, in his uh, fascinating article um, published in Belle is uh, is that um, the Ottomans tried to kind of protect the borders, um, kind of pre like to stop the spread of uh, Rinderpest uh, across the borders. And I think that was another kind of critical um, um, force for the empire to, to, to impose both regulations of the border or protection of the border and, uh, and the uh, uh, what's called um, and the uh, the uh, the spread of uh, Rinderpest uh, across the border, and also you might have um, known a Sabri article, Sabri Atish's article. One is uh, about the dead bodies burying uh, across the borders um, uh, between Iran and Ottoman uh, Iraq, uh, and that is that could also help um, us to to kind of see um, the 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 kind of Ottoman involvements of the protection of the borders through the dead bodies is just like imposition of the authority uh, as well. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now um, I don't see any more raised hands at this time, but there is one question in the chat we didn't address. Uh, do you, uh, This is coming from Deniz Er Öcal. Do you suspect there were similar periods in earlier centuries where severe climatic stress coincides with ethnic conflict or rebellions in the same region, or was the period you cover exceptional? Um, of course, I did mention while introducing Sam, uh, his first book, The Climate of Rebellion in the Early Modern Ottoman Empire, Sam um, demonstrated that the the I, it does. Actually, Sam is here. He could tell it himself, than me putting words into it. But uh, he, tried, he showed, I think, sort of the impact of climate on uh, the Jelali rebellions of the late 16th, early 17th centuries. Uh, but I, Zozan, Sam, would you like to add anything uh, to in answer to this question? I think Sam is the right person to answer that question, not me. <laughs> Well, in terms of climate, though, it does become difficult because we start to have different forms of physical evidence. So I, I would stress that it's, it's also hard to make a, a strict one-to-one -one comparison. Uh, so, for instance, uh, I, and I think we need to be careful about this, too, sometimes as historians, to be more precise. So I may have written somewhere that the 1590s was the worst drought in 600 years. Well, that's, that's if uh, you measure it by the data I had available at the time, which was uh, the persistence of drought in tree ring records that measured primarily whether each year, uh, you know, fell below a certain threshold of drought in terms of spring rainfall. Uh, but you could might find other so-called climate proxies, indirect indicators, uh, like uh, evaporates in uh, high resolution lake sediments that might tell you actually the drought in central and eastern Anatolia in the 1880s was even worse. Um, but it's, it's essentially, you're looking at different measures. Uh, I think the important thing to recognize is that, of course, drought is a recurring challenge in the region, whether we mean more precisely the region of Central and Eastern Anatolia uh, or the Middle East more broadly. 
Uh, so it's always a topic, I think, that, that does invite uh, more investigations and comparisons, um, even if we're not looking, uh, the comparisons aren't exactly apples to apples. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sam. And uh, then there was a, not a question, but a suggestion in the chat that I'd like to share anyway. Would anyone who teaches about Mediterranean environmental history be willing to share their syllabus? I'd be happy to share mine, says Thomas uh, Galan. And, and I mean, maybe you can use the chat to share with each other links if you have your syllabi on academia.edu, and that could provide an opportunity to spread uh, knowledge and curriculum. And then a, a final question came right now on chat. Uh, from Henry Misa, what is the relation between El Nino and Rinderpest? I don't think I'm able to answer that question. Um, so I haven't looked at at all uh, the kind of the relationship between series of droughts and uh, Rinderpest or series of severe cold and Rinderpest. Um, I can only say that uh, when animals are uh, physically weakened, uh, they can be more susceptible and vulnerable uh, to diseases. Uh, that would be my only kind of um, answer for the kind of the implications of like indirect implications of uh, El Nino related droughts or severe cold. So the, the, the vulnerability of the, the weakness, the physical uh, weakness of animals uh, could contribute um, to, to, for, uh, to, could contribute uh, to animals getting, getting sick faster than the healthy uh, animals. Uh, and Rinderpest is, is a completely uh, different parasite that affects the animals. So I, I, I'm not uh, able to answer that uh, question um, in this um, situation, unfortunately. All right, then I think I don't see any questions at the moment, although I encourage everyone to raise their hands or send a question over chat. So I'm gonna ask a question that I had, actually I have two, uh, but I'll ask one at this time. And please, I do encourage all the audience members to raise their hands or send their questions. Zozan, I was wondering whether um, you also, I mean, this is really definitely not part of climatic history. So you might not have included this in your larger study, but because you mentioned as the climate you know had an impact on livestock people had two choices well you know you go maybe steal other people's animals or you go settle and the question of land right around this time i think land uh was also becoming a little scarcer as there was another factor a demographic factor the the immigration of um circassians from the caucasus also occurred in the 19th century uh, and, and interestingly enough, Circassians were also among the people who got involved in the Armenian genocide. And, and uh, I am somewhat familiar with the work of uh, my colleague, Vladimir Hamid Troyansky, who is now at uh, UC Santa Barbara. Uh, he studied uh, sort of the impact of uh, Circassian immigration into the Ottoman Empire in three different geographical zones that he picked for his dissertation, I think he's now working to turn it into a book, One in the Balkans, and how that particular immigration had a major role to play in the uh, Balkan, in the Bulgarian uprisings. And then another region he picked was uh, what is today uh, Jordan, how uh, the Circassian immigrants were so crucial in the making of the current capital city of that country. I don't remember the third region he picked, but I suspect uh, they they were also around here. Did, did, did they play a role in the larger socioeconomic changes that took place? Is that something you considered? I, I would understand if you didn't, because it wouldn't come up to my mind directly with climate. This is more of a demographic thing, but I think it would impact sort of the, you know, the how do you share the pie of land if the government give some of the land to these new immigrants coming from the Caucasus. Uh, 
Yeah. Oh, no, it does. And actually, I do examine uh, this in my state chapter uh, and what I call hierarchy of concern, state's hierarchy of concern is uh, that um, in the as other parts of the empire, uh, a large number of uh, Cherkes and Chechen and other uh, uh, Muslim uh, refugees and immigrants uh, after the Crimean uh, war uh, uh, kind of uh, flow to the Ottoman Empire and this region they were inhabited kind of settled and uh, not inhabited, they uh, were settled uh, down in different parts of uh, empire. And of course, they increased the burden of, uh, in some areas like Arzurum, like Van, they increased the burden of uh, sedentary peasants. For example, just like one uh, sharp example, I, all of a sudden I remembered is that um, in an Armenian village, uh, uh, refugees, uh, animals were taken, were given to peasants uh, to feed them. So, and this, uh, and after that, um, uh, one of uh, uh, kind of buffalo of uh, uh, refugees uh, passed away, died, and the uh, the Ottomans forced the the Armenian peasants to cover the loss of expense. Um, so this type of uh, kind of policies were applied. Um, so these refugees had been settled between uh, some of like some of uh, kind of deserted Armenian or Kurdish villages. Uh, the land was was, was uh, given to them, and in some areas they were settled down in the pasture lands of Arabic or Kurdish speaking pastoralists. And even in the 1860s, the British actually are making comments that this is going to increase, this is going to be a problem later um, as this pasture land, as this land actually was, was not empty land, it was pasture land of pastoralists. And for Western Anatolia, um, Alcina Rabaji's work on Bursa actually is uh, uh, examine how uh, deep, uh, this possession uh, occurred uh, in in Bursa through the um, through the settlement of uh, refugees uh, in the uh, Armenian or Greek um, um, peasants uh, lands or in the or the Yurix, uh, the pa pastoralist pasture lands in 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 Bursa area in late nineteen uh, in the second half of the nineteenth uh, century uh, the the refugees were actually an important component of this uh, uh, this uh, story as Ottomans were kind of uh, treated them as a as a, 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 a kind of uh, um, an alliance uh, against these unruly nomads and uh, non-Muslim uh, subjects uh, of the of the region, and uh, they were given. Um, uh, was called uh, lands and uh, and that of course uh, in an area where you have um, kind of uh, you don't have a lot of arable land or you take the pastoralist pasture lands to to uh, to the to do newcomers of course that would increase uh, the tension uh, in in the in the region. Thank you, thank you so so much. And my second question is sort of not necessarily specific to this particular case, it's much larger and I would be very happy if actually Sam and other environmental historians in the uh, audience also jumped in and uh, join. I, I, it's more of a sort of, I don't know, philosophical larger question the, in the sense that the impact of the environment, the impact of physical things on things that happen in which these sort of physical infrastructure maybe forces people to do certain things. Well, does it force? How do we how do we sort of articulate the relationship? The reason I'm asking this is because in this particular case, your study could be taken and then said, "Oh, you see, uh, it, the situation was it, it could be seen by." some interpreters, oh, you know, the, here we see sort of an explanation for why these things happen, but actually, you know, at the end of the day, it was the government authorities who made certain decisions that actually pushed people uh, into action in the way that they did. So how do we build uh, in our language, in our articulation, uh, the impact of the environment on things that happen that actually are very political, human-made decisions at the end of the day, make the final calls? How do we build uh, that balance? 
This is a very big question and I would invite uh, Sam and Faisal and I think uh, Alan was here to, um, to, to involve, uh, uh, I, I'm not, I, like, I will be able to answer, but I would, I would like to listen Sam and Faisal and Isakar is uh, here too and all our wonderful environmental historians and James too, yeah. So I'll, I'll jump in, although I'm afraid I'm almost bound to give a bad answer because precisely because I'm writing a book about a number of these theoretical concepts. So I'm probably not seeing the, the forest from the trees here. Um, but what I would say is that confusion often arises um, from the nature of uh, multidisciplinary or even attempts at consilient explanations. Uh, that is when we are talking about environmental factors, when we explain say a drought in terms of El Nino. So we explain our knowledge uh, or reconstruction of the drought say in terms of tree rates. We're using a certain type of uh, what sometimes philosophers call an explanatory game, an approach to explanation, uh, in one in which we find a sort of categorical and sufficient account of an outcome and in terms of underlying physical processes. Uh, but when we explain historical outcomes, social outcomes, we're not giving that kind of uh, explanation. We're playing a different explanatory game, as it were, one that looks for uh, necessary conditions. Uh, within a broader context of contingency for aspects of an outcome. Uh, and I think it's important to note that when we do environmental history, even as it is more consilient, even as it goes down to the uh, scientific evidence and then the processes by which we derive information from that, uh, in the end, our explanation of the impact of environmental affairs is still likely to be one uh, within a historical explanatory framework. Uh, that is to say, we're going to point to factors like drought uh, as necessary conditions for aspects of outcome. They don't, as it were, um, provide a different kind of explanation. They don't provide a categorical explanation or fully sufficient explanation uh, for the outcome. So one simplified way to think about this is just to ask yourself, what distinction about the environment made what difference in the outcome? Uh, not, you know, did drought cause the um, uh, massacres? And therefore, you know, it, as the cause, it, it uh, uh, obviates other causes or eliminates personal or collective responsibility. No, I think you have to ask, well, what, what distinction about the, the environment? Was it the severity, the persistence of droughts, um, the fact, the timing of them? Um, explains what difference in the outcome. The timing of the outcome, the severity of the outcome, the opportunity for the state to create that kind of outcome. Uh, or, or so on. Um, so I think if we use that kind of framework, we think more contrastively, contingently, um, we can keep our explanations from uh, you know, derailing the kinds of traditional explanatory frameworks that we use, and we can help them fit into the bigger picture. Sam, thank you so much. That was really, really helpful. And I, I think right now we are beyond our 90 minute time. Uh, I'm going to ask for a favor uh, from everybody uh, because my uh, video is turned off because of my camera's malfunction. I would appreciate it very much if more of you uh, turned on your cameras so that we have a, a final moment in the video recording with more cameras on as I turn it into gallery recording. And so we would have in our video, not my face without a bit, just a picture, but a few good faces, maybe smiling and saying goodbye. And thank you all. Thank you so, so much. I really appreciate everyone coming. Uh, Zozan, thank you for a wonderful presentation. Sam, thank you so much for taking the time to join us and moderate. Nora, thank you so much for your uh, commentary. And everyone, thank you for being here, for asking questions and joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Have a wonderful, wonderful uh, week. And I hope you'll consider joining us again next Friday. Bye. <laughs>